Hello, this is Matt Dean with A Plus College Ready, and today we're going to talk a little bit about population ecology. So ecology is the study of the interactions uh, between organisms and their environment. It's affected by abiotic and biotic factors. Abiotic factors are environmental factors that aren't living. Things like the temperature, the availability of light and water and nutrients, soil, and even wind. Biotic factors are environmental factors that are living or at least are related to living things. These can include things like the bacteria, the protists, the fungi, the plants, the animals in an environment. It can also include things like competi competition between organisms and symbiotic relationships that occur between organisms. Ecologists often study ecology at five different levels. First, at the organismal level where they're looking at individual living things and the adaptations that allow them to live in a specific environment. Next, at the population level. So a population is a group of the same species of organism living in the same place at the same time. In population ecology, um, ecologists study size, density, and the structure of populations. The community level is the next level. Here, uh, scientists study the interactions between different populations that live in the same area or the same habitat. Next, we've got the ecosystem level. These ecologists study ecosystems, which are the communities that live in a place and how those communities interact with the environment. Ecosystem ecologists often look at how energy flows through a system and how that matter or nutrients are recycled through that ecosystem. Finally, we look at the biosphere level. Here, ecologists look at how all the ecosystems interact and how they affect the entire Earth. So here we see our different levels, all the way from the biggest, the biosphere level, all the way down to the smallest or the individual organism level. So those five levels that we just looked at, from, from biosphere down to organism, we introduce them from small to large, starting with the organismal level, working up to the biosphere level. Um, each of those levels has emergent properties, new properties that aren't present in the, the level below, but emerge because the parts and the organisms interact and, and form relationships. So let's talk specifically about population ecology now. So as we said earlier, a population includes all the organisms of the same species that live in the same area at the same time and show some signs of reproduction with each other. Sort of a subfield of population ecology is demography. So demography is the statistical study of populations and how those populations change over time. Oftentimes, population ecologists focus on the size of the population which you're gonna see oftentimes abbreviated with a capital N, and the population density, which is the number of individuals per unit of area, or if we're talking about like an aquatic environment, the number of individuals per unit of volume. So these are really important for describing the status of a population and also for making predictions about how the populations might change. So let's talk about measuring population size. So typically, it's not um, possible in terms of time or it's not cost effective to count each member of a large population. So scientists can use different ways to estimate the size of a population. The two most important types of sampling uh, used in ecology are the quadrant method and the mark recapture method. So in the quadrant method, scientists are going to block off small areas um, of the habitat, and they're going to count all the organisms in that ha in that quadrant. They're going to take do that with multiple quadrants. They're going to take the area of that quadrant and then use that to estimate how many organisms are in the whole habitat. So this type of method works best for for either organisms that are immobile or things that are slow moving, maybe like a slug or something. Uh, another method is called the mark recapture method. So this works best for things that are moving, mobile organisms. So it involves taking a sample of organisms 
and then somehow marking them either with a tag or paint or a band or some kind of transmitter. Um, the marked organisms are then released back into their original environment. And then sometimes later, a new sample is collected from the same environment. So that new sample should include some of the marked individuals from the first sample and some individuals that were never caught or captured during that first sample. The ratio of the marked to unmarked individuals can then be used to estimate the entire population size. So let's look at a kind of a, a sample and a formula for how to do that. So here's the common formula we're going to use. So we're going to take the ratio of the marked individuals over the total population size. And we're going to set that equal to the number of organisms that are recaptured in the second sample divided by the size of the second sample. So we're trying to find the population size, the total population size in. So let's solve our ratio for n to get this equation. So n is equal to the total of marked individuals in the first sample times the size of the second sample, lowercase n, divided by the number of organisms recaptured in the second sample. In that case, this is m. So let's use this in a sample problem. So here's our sample problem. An ecologist samples and marks 20 birds from a population. So we're looking, we're going to be looking for n. So again, we're looking for n. So what we just found out is that we're taking a sample of 20 birds. So that's going to be the, um, well, let's hold that for a second. We're going to mark 20 birds. So that's the total of marked individuals. That's capital M. So N is going to be equal to 20. Keep reading. Two weeks later, he captures another sample of 20 birds. So the second sample size is also 20. And that's again, that's N, little N. Keep reading. In the recaptured sample, there are five birds that were marked from the first sample. What is the estimated size of the bird population? So five of the original 20 were recaptured in the second sample. That five represents little m, the, set, um, the number of recaptures. That goes on the bottom of our fraction. So to, to estimate the sample, so the population size, 20 times 20, 400, divided by five, that's gonna give us an estimated population size of somewhere around 80. All right, so that's using the mark recapture method. And we, and again, what we're trying to do there is estimate the population size. Another thing that um, population ecologists are often interested in is the patterns of dispersion or how organisms are distributed um, in their environment. There's three main types of dispersion or distribution patterns that we see in ecology. One of them is either called a clumped, aggregated, or clustered. So in this kind of pattern, individuals are found in, together in groups. It's common in plants that drop their seeds on the ground so that they sort of all grow together, and in animals that live in either schools or, or herds. So the clumped might look something like this. So we have a small group of organisms here, another small one here, another one there, and so on. Another pattern is uniform. This is when the organisms are evenly distributed, evenly spaced throughout a habitat. This is pretty common in animals that stake out territories and defend those territories. So that might look sort of like, um, sort of like this. They're not clustered. They're, dis they're dispersed evenly, spread out completely. And then the last one is just random. So in this pattern, individuals are just in no particular order or pattern. It's common in plants that have wind dispersed seeds, like with dandelions, for example. Again, there's no real pattern to where the organisms are found in this kind of dispersion pattern. Another thing that population ecologists like to look at are what are called life tables. These tables summarize the birth and death rates for organisms at different stages of their lives. The data in these tables can be used to predict how a population is likely to grow or shrink. Uh, so let's look at an example of a life table. So this is for a sheep. So notice between um, zero and half a year, um, we started off with a thousand individuals. 
at the beginning of this time interval. During that time interval, 54 died. So we calculated the age-specific mortality rate. To do that, we took the number of deaths divided by the total population size at the beginning of the interval. So in this case, that would be the 54 divided by 1,000 to get a 0 0.054 mortality rate. Let's skip on down a bit. So from uh, the age interval, six to seven years. So there were 688 sheep alive at the beginning of that interval. During that time, 48 of them died. So to get the age specific mortality rate, we take 48 divided by 688 to get an age specific mortality rate of 0.0698. Let's drop on down a little bit further. From 11 to 12, there were 96 surviving sheep. During that time interval, 90 of those died. So the age specific mortality rate for that time interval is 90 divided by 96, which is 0.9375. That's a really high mortality rate. That's saying that nearly 94% of the surviving sheep died during that time interval. That, that probably means that 11 to 12 years old is near the end of the life expectancy of this type of sheep. All right, another thing that population ecologists like to talk about are survivorship curves. Survivorship curves are graphs that show the number or proportion of individuals surviving to each age for a given species or a group. They're constructed from a given cohort. A cohort is a group of individuals of about the same age. Um, and this information that is used to, to make these survivorship curves typically comes from a life table. Now we're going to talk about three specific kinds of survivorship curves, type one, type two, and type three. Type one individuals survive uh, well early in life, and they generally live quite a few years. At an advanced age, near the end of their life expectancy, the death rate increases very dramatically, and most of them die relatively quickly. Large mammals, like uh, elephants, for example, even humans, typically are going to uh, have this type of survivorship curve. So here's a type one survivorship curve. Notice at the beginning of life, most of the organisms survive and make it. And that's because these organisms are usually providing a lot of uh, parental care to the organisms. But as the organisms age, for example, to somewhere around maybe 80-ish, between 70 and 80, the death rate, the mortality rate um, goes up dramatically and the organisms die off very quickly until they eventually reach uh, their maximum um, age range. And it, by that point in time, they're all dead. So again, that's a type one survivorship curve. That's the kind of survivorship curve we would see in people, elephants, large mammals. All right, in a type two survivorship curve, individuals have a death rate that's relatively constant throughout their whole life expectancy. These kinds of curves are exhibited by lizards, the hydra, um, some small mammals along the way, also some birds. So notice here, the mortality rate is essentially constant throughout. We've got a, a straight line with a constant slope. Um, there's not a lot of parental care here at the beginning, so the, there's some deaths at the beginning of life, and the death rate continues to be constant all the way to the end of the life expectancy. And then we talk about a type three survivorship curve. These organisms have um, a very low chance of survival at the beginning of life because their parents aren't really providing much parental care at all. Um, those that do make it may live to a fairly advanced age. This kind of survivorship curve is exhibited by lots of insects uh, and fish. So notice at the beginning in a type three, most of the organisms die before they reach any uh, measurable age. But if they make it, some of them live for a fairly long time until by the end of the life expectancy, they're all gone. So again, that's a type three survivorship curve. 
Let's also talk a bit about age sex structures. So age sex structures, also called age sex pyramids, graphically display um, a population by breaking it down into males and females and the number of males and females that are present at each age range. Usually the left side of the pyramid graphs the male population and the right, the female population. The X axis displays the number of individuals of a particular age or a percentage of the population at that age. And the center of the pyramid starts at zero population and extends out to the left for males and right for females in terms of increasing size or proportion. Along the vertical axis, the Y axis, um, the HX pyramids display ages in usually five, five year increments from birth at the bottom all the way up to old age at the top. So here's an example of an age sex structure. Now this is from Gabon, which is a fairly poor country in Africa. So notice down at the bottom, we're looking at the zero to four age group. Here we have the female population and the male population. Notice in this particular pyramid, the base is very wide and the top of the pyramid is very small. Not very many people in Gabon, in this case, are, are living to old age. There's a lot of young people. What this pattern shows you is that this population is going to grow fast because there's lots of individuals down here that are about to reach reproductive age. So here's some other age sex structures. So this is, this is like the structure we saw in Gabon, very wide at the base, very narrow at the top. That's where you're going to get rapid population growth. In other, um, other countries, maybe a little bit like the United States, you still may have a wide base, but the, uh, the middle and the top are much wider than they were over here. So here we're still getting growth, but the growth is slower because the, the reproductive age segment of the population is a smaller chunk of the population than it was over here in the rapid growth sex structure. Some age sex structures look more like this. This might be in a place like say Italy. Um, here you've got sort of a cone shaped age sex structure. And what that's saying is that, yeah, there's a lot of uh, people that are about to be reproductive age, but there's also a lot of people in here that are about to be um, non-reproductive. And there's a small part of the population that's, that's near death. So these are going to give you more of a stable zero population growth situation. There's even a few places on earth where the human population is shrinking. Japan would be an example. In this case, the pyramid's very wide in the middle. It's sort of tapered at the bottom and tapered at the top. These people are probably nearing the end of reproductive age. There's not nearly as many people coming up behind them to replace them. So the percentage of the population that's reproductive age is getting smaller and smaller across time, which means eventually the population is going to shrink. So again, these age sex structures allow ecologists to make some predictions about what's going to happen to the, the population size in the future. So let's also talk a bit about what are called life history strategies. Darwinian fitness is calculated as the number of offspring an organism leaves behind that go on to reproduce themselves. Really in biology or in evolution, getting as many copies of your genes to the next generation, it's really the only goal of life. So organisms use these things called life history strategies to achieve this goal of passing on their genes to the next generation. These strategies have been shaped dramatically by natural selection. So a definition for a life history strategy is an age and stage specific pattern of the timing of events in life. Things like birth, weaning, maturation, and death are all parts of these strategies. So in, um, in AP Biology, we're going to talk mainly about two types of life history strategies. One of those is called R selection and the other is called K selection. So let's, let's start with R selection. The little R here stands for reproduction. 
The general strategy of organisms that follow our selection is to produce as many offspring as possible and hope that some of them survive and reproduce and pass on those genes to the next generation. These species put a very small investment of resources into each offspring. They, pro they provide very little parental care, um, very little effort to ensuring that the baby, each individual baby survives. They're not generally very invested in, again, protecting the young. Often, the eggs are fertilized and then dispersed, and the parent has no other contact with the babies. The benefit of this strategy um, is that it works to ensure that reproduction happens even if resources are, are limited and unpredictable. Each individual is very likely to die early, but because these organisms produce so many individual offspring, some of them make it to the next generation. This type of, of life history strategy tends to work in, in environments that are less competitive, sort of low quality, unstable environments. Typically, our selected strategies are used by smaller animals with shorter lifespans, um, things like fish, insects, tend to exhibit this kind of strategy. The young tend to be born um, and then mature very rapidly. That's called precocial. Um, they develop early independence. Our selected species tend to follow a type three survivorship curve, which again means that most of them die right after birth or maybe even before birth. A few live on to maximum life expectancy. So it's a type three. Oftentimes they'll exhibit exponential growth. So we'll see if we're looking at population size graphed against time, you'll get this big J-shaped exponential growth curve. Oftentimes that's followed by a period of rapid death. So again, that's R selection. Now let's also talk a bit about K selection. So K refers here to carrying capacity. And what this means is that the offspring from K selected organisms are entering into a, an environment that's competitive. It's in a population that's near the carrying capacity. Um, K-selected organisms and K-selected strategies, um, they tend toward putting a heavy investment into each offspring. Typically, these organisms don't make a whole lot of babies, but they provide a lot of parental care and effort into making sure that those babies survive. This strategy tends to be um, common in organisms that are larger and in organisms that have pretty long life expectancies. The babies tend to be born fairly immature and it takes quite a while for them to, to grow up. Um, again, heavy parental care and nurturing, lots of time devoted to teaching the offspring, um, fierce protection of the babies. Um, these babies have a high probability of survival and making it to maturity. Um, and like I said earlier, it's not always true, but typically these organisms are larger animals like whales and elephants and humans that have longer lifespans. The generations overlap. They're alive at the same time. Um, case selection typically is found in environments that are pretty stable and organisms that are case selected typically follow a type one survivorship curve. And oftentimes they exhibit logistical or logistic growth. And what that means if we graph population size against time, so the population reaches carrying capacity, and then it may oscillate around the carrying capacity slightly. So those are K-selected species. It's important to note that R and K selection are two extreme sides of, of this um, life history strategy, and then most things are probably somewhere in the middle. So another thing that population um, ecologists like to look at are population dynamics. In theory, any species could reproduce so many times that it could dominate and essentially take over the earth. But in the real world, that doesn't happen because of the availability of resources. It's, it's limited. Things like water, food, shelter, nutrients limits the size of a population. Population dynamics, though, is the study of how populations change in terms of size and composition over time. 
And there's all kinds of mathematical models and equations that scientists can use to describe these changes and to predict future changes. We're going to start by discussing exponential growth. Exponential growth is growth whose rate becomes ever more rapid in proportion to an increasing population number. During this whole discussion, we're going to use the letter N to indicate the population size or the population number. This kind of growth tends to occur in populations that have plenty of resources. They have an abundant supply of food, water, space, nesting areas, and so on. In exponential growth, the change in the population size can be symbolized as dn over dt. I want you to think of this d as a delta, and that's saying the change in population size equals or over the change in time. So your formula sheet, your AP biology formula sheet is going to write it this way. For some of you, it might be a little bit less confusing to think of it like that. We can calculate the change in population size using this equation, which is also found on your AP formula sheet. Notice that you've got R max. Sometimes you'll see that just written as R times N. R max is the growth rate per individual. We're going to call it the per capita growth rate, the growth rate per individual in the population. To calculate that value, the R max, the per capita growth rate, you simply take the number of births minus the number of deaths and you divide that all by the total population size. During exponential growth, R max is constant regardless of the population size. <clears throat> when exponential growth happens, we're going to see if we were graphing it as a population size, graphed against time, our growth curve is going to look sort of like a J. And you can see during this whole curve, the slope is increasing. Therefore, the rate of change of population size is always changing. It's always increasing might be a better way to think of it. Exponential growth in the real world is not really sustainable because there's a finite amount of materials. Um, eventually, food supplies start to run out. Water starts to run out. Space starts to run out. And the population can't continue to grow uh, forever. So here's a, a more cleaned up population growth curve, an exponential population growth curve. And again, note it's got that characteristic J shape. Let's also talk about logistic growth. This is a type of growth whose rate decreases as the population size starts to approach the carrying capacity. We're going to use the letter K to represent carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is essentially the, the maximum number of organisms that a, an environment can sustain. It's determined by things such as the amount of available space, the amount of available food and water, and so on. The change in the population size in this kind of scenario can be found, again, using DN over DT, change in population size over time equals R, and again, that's the growth rate, times N, but this time we're also going to multiply it by this factor, K minus N all over K. And if you pay attention to this bullet right here, that K minus N over K term is essentially the fraction of the carrying capacity that has not yet been used up. Um, the bigger N gets, the more of that gets used up. Um, so the more carrying capacity that has been used up, the more the K minus N over K term will reduce the growth rate. Because again, as N goes up, the top value of this fraction is going to go down, and we're going to be multiplying N by some fraction. And the bigger N gets, the smaller and smaller this fraction gets. So as the population gets bigger and bigger, the R max gets smaller and smaller in logistic growth. So again, during logistic growth, R max decreases as the size of the population increases. Our logistic growth curves are going to have sort of a characteristic S shape, and we'll see that in a second. 
Another thing to think about with logistic growth, when the population is really, really small, n is very small compared to k. And therefore, k minus n over k is pretty much r max times n. We could think of when the population is small, this term is uh, very close to being 1. And therefore, the population growth, the change in population size, is essentially the same as it would be in exponential growth. But as n increases, this term becomes smaller and smaller, and therefore the per capita growth rate also becomes smaller and smaller. Here's a logistic growth curve. Again, it's got sort of a, an S shape to it. Notice we're going to talk about four phases that happen during logistic growth. We're also going to notice that once the population size gets up to um, about this level right here, that it tends to oscillate around that. Whatever that value is right in there, that's the carrying capacity. And once the population size reaches the carrying capacity, in most cases, it's going to stay pretty close to that value. When we're talking about the stages of a logistic growth curve, we're going to talk about the lag phase, the exponential growth phase, the deceleration phase, and the stable equilibrium phase. So let's talk just a moment about each one of those. So during the lag phase, and again, notice during the lag phase, it's called lag because the population growth is not happening very fast there. So the lag phase is the period of time immediately after a new population is established. For a while, the population remains small and pretty constant in terms of size. Um, at that point, both natality, which is birth, and mortality, which is death, both of those rates are pretty low. The lag phase occurs because reproduction doesn't happen instantaneously. Once the new organisms move into this new environment, they have to mate. It takes time for the young to be born. And depending on the kind of organism, that could take a very long time. Then we've got exponential growth. Right in there. Notice that the slope of the whole curve is highest during the exponential growth phase. So the exponential growth phase is the period of time when a population is growing rapidly. Exponential growth results in a population increasing by the same percentage every year because during that exponential growth stage, our max is essentially constant. The deceleration phase is the next one. And notice that during that deceleration phase, the slope of our line begins to decrease a bit. That means the rate of growth, or the rate of population growth, is starting to decrease. Um, so again, during the deceleration phase, the population growth rate begins to slow. The number entering the population by reproduction remains pretty high, but some start to die. And therefore, the population growth rate starts to slow down. The size of the population continues to get bigger. We're not talking about a decreasing population just the rate at which the population size is increasing is slowing down. Finally, we get to the stable equilibrium phase. That's this. At the stable equilibrium phase, um, the population stops growing and it stays steady somewhere near the carrying capacity typically. And that's essentially because the birth rate, the natality, is equal to the death rate, the mortality at that point. Now we're going to look at a couple of calculations. Starting out here, we have a population of dandelions, little plants. Uh, they have a one-year reproductive cycle. Um, and we've got the following data. So we're, we're starting off with 1,000 plants in our population. During this year, there's 200 new seedlings and 40 of the original plants died. So first of all, we want to know the number of births. Well, for plants, New seedlings are births, so that's just 200. We also want to know the number of deaths. Well, the problem tells us that 40 plants died during that first year. So we're just going to pencil in 40. Now, the per capita birth rate. Remember, that's the birth rate per individual. To calculate that, we had 200 births out of the total population size of 1,000. 
So if we divide that out, our per capita growth rate is 0.2. And I'm going to write it as 0 0.20. Our per capita death rate, we're going to calculate the same way. We had 40 deaths out of a total population size of 1,000. So we divide that out and we get 0 0.04 as our death rate. Our per capita growth rate we can find in two way, in one of two ways. We can subtract the birth rate from the death rate. 0 0.2 minus 0 0.04 would give us 0.16. Or we could take the change in the population size. So there were 200 new births. There were 40 deaths. That means we got 160 new individuals out of a total popula original population size of 1,000. So that gives us 0.16 as our R max or our reproductive rate. All right, so next, assume the population of dandelions is undergoing exponential growth at the rate of R max. Calculate the number of dandelions found in the population over six generations and, in, and record your calculations in table three. So at Time zero, generation zero, we started with a thousand individuals. To calculate the size after one generation, which is one, one year, we're going to use our equation dn over dt equals r max times n. Now remember that r max is 0.16 and that n was our original population size, 1000. So 1000 times 0.16 is 160. That's how many new individuals total are added to our population. That's our change in population size over time. So we had a thousand, we added 160, which means after generation one, we have 1160 individuals. We repeat that same calculation for the next generation. So again, we'll take our max of 0.16, this time times our new population size, which is 1160. Um, all right, so this time we'll go 0.16 times 1160, and that gives us 185.6. Well, we can't get 0.6 individuals, so I'm going to round that off to 186. So between generation one and two, our population grows by 186. So we're going to say 186 plus our generation one population size, which was 1160. 1160 plus 186. So after generation two, we have 1,346 individuals. Well, we do the same calculation for generation three. We replace our population size with 1,346. We multiply 0.16, our per capita growth rate, times 1346 that gives us 215.36 we'll just round that off to 215 so we're going to take that 215 which is our change in population size over time our population growth we're going to add that to 1346 so 215 plus 1346 we end up with 1561 as our new population size Repeat that calculation for the next generation. So we'll take 0.16 times 1561. That gives us 249.7, so we'll round that off to 250. So that's our population growth. We're going to add that to our population size after generation 3, 1561. So 1561 plus 250, so we're at 1811. And then we'll do that one more time for the last generation. So this time we'll take 0.16, the per capita growth rate, times 1861. That gives us 297.76, we'll round that to 298. That's how much our population grew during that generation. 
We'll take the 298 and add it to our population size, which was 1811. So we end up with a population size by the fifth generation of 2109 individuals. All right, moving on to the next problem. It says you now begin to monitor a new population of dandelions. The initial population number in is 60, and the dandelions have a per capita growth rate, or max, of 0.3. The field in which the dandelions grow is very small, so the carrying capacity for the population of dandelions is 80. Calculate the change in population size, dn over dt, for this group of dandelions after one generation. So this time we're talking about logistic growth because resources are limited. Now remember that our equation for that looks a little different than the equation for exponential growth. This is what our equation looks like. dn over dt equals r times n times the fraction k minus n all over k. So for this calculation, let's take our r max, which is 0.3, times our initial population size, which was 60, times k, the carrying capacity, which the problem told us was 80, minus the population size, 60, all over k again. And again, k is 80. So let's do the math, 0 0.30 times 60 times the a quantity 80 minus 60 over 80. And what we end up with is 9. Let me correct myself there. If we redo the math here, 0 0.3 times 60 times the fraction 80 minus 60 over 80, that actually comes out to be 4.5. So let's round that off to 5. So during this one-year time interval, our change in population number over time is 5. So we started with a population of 60 after one year, after one generation, we would have a population of 65. Question two, which type of growth are the dandelions undergoing as n approaches k? And explain your answer. Well, this is logistic growth. As n, as, as remember, during exponential growth, we're going to get a growth curve like so. That can happen as long as resources are unlimited. But as uh, the population size starts to approach the carrying capacity, the population size will level off and it will start to oscillate around that carrying capacity. That is logistic growth. Question three, other than size, what other factors help to determine the carrying capacity of a specific environment? That could be things like the availability of food, the availability of water, and any kind of other environmental concerns. Let's talk a little bit more about carrying capacity. Remember, it's abbreviated with a capital K. Carrying capacity is essentially the number of organisms that an environment can sustain. It's limited by the availability of, of resources, things like water, sunlight, nutrients, space, and shelter. When any of these factors is scarce, competition happens. This uh, interest-specific competition intensifies as the population size gets bigger and bigger, and this helps to set the carrying capacity. Another thing that affects carrying capacity is the accumulation of waste. Uh, the waste can build up and limit the population size as well. If a population exceeds the carrying capacity, the population is usually just going to die back down to that original carrying capacity and probably oscillate around it a little bit. But if the population increases dramatically too fast, the environment may be damaged and some of the resources that were there may not be there anymore. So the population may die back down to a new but lower carrying capacity. Or if the population really damaged the environment, the population may completely die out. Here we can see all three of those options. So typically, like we said, the population size is going to oscillate Population size is going to oscillate around the carrying capacity. But, like we said, if the population gets too large and damages the environment, the population may die back down to a new but lower carrying capacity. Or, if there's extreme damage to the environment, population may die completely out. So, those are consequences of overshooting the carrying capacity. So, let's also talk about some things called limiting factors. 
Limiting factors are environmental factors that determine the population size. This particular category is density dependent. So density dependent limiting factors affect the per capita growth rate um, differently depending on the, the density of the population. Typically as population size and population density increase, the resources in the environment are limited and competition increases. What that means is that density dependent factors cause the per capita growth rate to decrease with population size increases. So R goes down as N goes up. That's essentially what we mean. This is another example of negative feedback in biology. In this case, this feedback loop helps to regulate the population size. Most of the density dependent limiting factors that we talk about in AP Bio are, are biotic, related to life. Some examples of those are predation. Uh, disease is another density dependent limiting factor, the buildup of waste, and also interest specific competition. Let's talk just a bit about each one of those. So we'll start off with predation. We know that predation is when one organism feeds on another. Oftentimes these predator, predators and prey co-evolve and it's almost like an arms race where they evolve together. The prey of try to evolve defenses against predation and the predator evolves new tools to make them better at finding and capturing the prey. We also see that oftentimes we get these um, patterns where the predator and prey populations sort of determine the population of each other and they alternate uh, through cycles. So here we can see a, a relationship between a lynx and a snowshoe hare. So for example, um, right in here, the snowshoe hare population increase dramatically. Well, just a little while later, um, the hare population increased dramatically. But now there's, a, I mean, the lynx population increased dramatically. But now there's a whole lot of lynx out there. So they're eating a whole lot of rabbits. So right after this lynx population peak, the hare population drops because of predation. Well, eventually, the hare population drops so low there's not enough of them for the lynx to eat. So with a little bit of lag time, notice the lynx population re reaches, a, reaches a low. And they just alternate back and forth like that. So that's predator-prey dynamics. As I said a minute ago, the coevolution between predator and prey is really important. Um, some adaptations that allow predators to be more successful, uh, increased speed, um, sharp teeth and sharp claws, camouflage. Uh, also, most predators have eyes located near the front of their head, and this allows them to have uh, depth perception, three-dimensional vision. On the other hand, the prey have adaptations to avoid predation. Oftentimes, they'll live in groups like herds or shoals for protection. They also are built for speed. They have defenses like poison or stingers, camouflage, sometimes called cryptic coloration to avoid being seen by the predators. Oftentimes they'll have eyes located on the sides of their head and that gives them a wider field of vision so they can see things on all sides coming toward them. Some other types of, um, of uh, adaptations that help prey to avoid predation, aposematic coloration. This is sometimes called warning coloration. And this is what we see in, in animals like the poison dart frog where they're brightly colored and they're essentially warning predators that, hey, I'm poisonous probably shouldn't eat me. There's also mimicry. And this is a kind of an evolved resemblance between an organism and a dangerous or unpleasant organism. In Batesian mimicry, in Batesian mimicry an edible organism resembles a noxious or dangerous organism. And this gives it protection. For example, um, the relationship between the king snake which is not poisonous, and the poisonous coral snake. They're both red, yellow, and black. They have bands, they look very similar. Some predators avoid the king snake because they can't tell the difference between the king snake and the coral snake. 
There's another type of mimicry called malaria mimicry. In this type, several unpalatable or dangerous species all have similar, similar warning colors or patterns. Essentially, they're sending out a group message. We're all dangerous. You shouldn't mess with any of us. A good example of this type of mimicry is found in uh, bees, wasps, and yellow jackets. Lots of them are yellow with black stripes. And they're essentially all sending out a group message, don't mess with us. It's malaria mimicry. We talked about disease being another density-dependent limiting factor. These diseases spread more easily when population density is high and organisms are crowded together. Waste buildup happens more quickly um, when there's a lot of organisms creating waste. And then competition gets more intense when um, the uh, population density increases because those organisms are all competing for the same water, shelter, mates, and other resources. Now we'll also mention density independent limiting factors. These uh, limiting factors affect the per capita growth rate or regardless of the population density. Typically these are going to be things like natural disasters, fires and floods, severe weather, even pollution. Unlike the density dependent factors, um, density independent factors alone can't maintain a constant population size. Oftentimes, these factors lead to large and erratic shifts in the size of the population. So a natural disaster might kill off a large chunk of the population. It drops down and it takes time for it to come back. All right, that does it for our population ecology screencast. Hope that helps.